All right, let's begin. Okay, so today, let's do a bit of exam review. What do you say? Lecture 20, exam 2 review. Okay. So, um, good question. What's going to be on the exam? next week. So I think the things that we'll focus on are probably dictionaries, uh, recursion, file IO. Um, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, once the semester is over, um, I don't take anything down um, unless I unless I get some kind of order from the university or something, which um, maybe binary hex. It's it's hard to test this, you know. It's hard to test this because the problem is that. Uh, Well, you know, the problem is really just that, like, this is it, the topic itself. Um, you know, basically, if you have access to a computer, you can just either um, write a function or you can even just use the inbuilt functions to do almost all the calculations for you. So if I can find a way to make binary interesting, maybe I'll do something like that. Um, yeah, okay, so functions, recursion, file IO. So let's. <clears throat> So basically, in terms of, because I don't think functions were on the first exam technically. I think dictionaries might have been, but functions were definitely not. Recursion was definitely not. So, hmm. So let's do a little review of uh, functions. Let's just start out with functions. So remember that uh, if you want to define a function, obviously, you use the def. And then you say something like, uh, my new function. So what, are, what is this new function going to do? It's going to remove all a's from a string. The exam is next week. That's, that's why I'm doing review now. So, um, Okay, so let's see what we want to do here. So if we have a string, uh, or if we have a new string and we want to remove all the a's from it, then let's say we create a new string, right? And then we might do something like, say, for c in a string, if c is in, say, lowercase lowercase a or uppercase a or uppercase a or lowercase a um, then you say new string plus equals c else you do nothing you return new string so basically this is this is kind of a good example of a function in the sense that this function is going to take in a string it's going to have a function name um, sometimes they call uh, this line is like the function definition and then everything under here so from here um, down to here is called the function body and this is a return statement obviously um, and so this is something and so remember that the function uh, doesn't go on after a return statement so that's that's something so you can have multiple return statements inside of a single function. Um, yeah, so that's a good little example of a function. Let's do another example of maybe a recursive function. So what kind of recursive function should we do? Um,
So let's do an example of a recursive function. So maybe we'll have a function that says uh, call it. So remember that recursion just means a process that calls itself. So, so in this case, we have our processes, our, uh, our functions. Uh, can you have a function header? So there's not really function headers because if as soon as you do, there's no way to do like def header of function and then like a, like a semicolon or something and then you have def actual, you know. Okay, here it goes. So this, this is not possible. So what's a good, um, What's a good recurs recursive function? Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll do a little teaching. Maybe we'll talk about binary search. So here's a good example of a binary uh, of a of a recursive function. So let's say that you want to search for something inside of a list, um, but you don't want to just go through each element. Um, you want to do it a little bit more, let's say, quickly, intelligently, something. So what you're going to do is, here's the idea. Um, you're going to start at the list size um, over 2. If the list element, or if the element we're searching for is uh, bigger than the value at the position we'll go right uh, otherwise we'll go left and if we find it we'll return true if we don't return false so there's one assumption that we have to make about this list a list must be a sorted list um, hmm, I'll have to think about that. So, um, let's say, find me, and so, yeah, so that's the assumption that we have to make. So let's, let's create a random list. So let's import random, and then let's make a random list. So, um, my list is equal to random dot rand int say zero to one hundred for blank in range one hundred. There we go. And then what we'll do is we'll search through the list. We'll print out the list so that we know what it is, and we'll binary search through the list of my list for say the number thirty-two. And I'm going to stick. I'm going to use a default argument here, so we'll also print out this. Um, the default argument is going to be uh, minus one, and I'll show you what I'm what that does in just a second. Um, yeah, that's a coding standard. Import does go at the top. Um, okay, if that's what you want. Okay, so let's just say that if uh, the current position is equal to minus one, then we'll have to set it. So then we'll set it to divided by two. So this is just to set the default argument. So remember what a default argument does, or if I've never actually mentioned that. So the thing is here, you notice that I didn't pass in something for the current position, I just left it blank, or I didn't actually, there should be another argument here. but um, basically the point is that because I didn't pass anything in, it gets assigned a negative one. If I do pass something in, then it's not assigned a negative one. So this only applies if you skip this argument. The blank is like for I, yeah, it's just because I never use that I, I don't actually need it. So it's just, um, the blank here is this, this piece of code is technically 
somewhat forbidden. So don't worry about this. This is just so that we, we can get ourselves going with the... Um... Oh yeah, and we have to do mylist.sort. So, okay. So, uh, what do we do now? So this, is, this isn't this is even a base case. This is just setting us up. This is our beginning case. So now if, um, let's say here, um, let's say if find me is equal to a list at current position, then we're going to return true. Um, for the only reason that's forbidden is because this is a list comprehension, uh, and I haven't really taught anything about this. I feel like I almost shouldn't say anything to that. Um, Well, I mean, so basically, okay, so given that there's questions about it, basically it's just like this. For i in range 100, um, my list dot append random dot randint 0, 100, my list equals blank. So this is the alternative code that doesn't involve comprehensions. Okay. So sort will sort the list using temp sort, uh, which is uh, it's temp sort is a it's a uh, combination of merge sort and insertion sort. So the guy um, I think maybe you capitalized temp sort because that's a it's actually just some guy's name just Tim. Okay. So if the, basically, let's think about how this works, right? Let's say that we have a list and it's sorted and we're looking for, say we have one, two, five, seven, eight, and 12. And say we're looking for two. So we go to the position, uh, so this has length six. So length six divided by two is actually three. So it'll go to this position here. And so we see that the, the value is that we're looking for. So we're looking for. Uh, so we're looking for two, and so two is smaller than seven. And we know this list is sorted, so we know that the element has to be on this side if it's in the list. And so then what we do is so this is with current position uh, is equal to three. And so then the next time we go through the list, we just look at the front part of the list. We basically just look at um, this part with uh, the current position is equal to, well, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to divide by 2. And so that's going to be 1. And so that is going to be 2. So the value is 2, return true. And then it'll come back up to this call, which will return uh, basically the, the call on the next one. Okay. Um, okay. So the other, the one other base case that we should have before we go into this is if not a list. So if a list is empty, we should just return false, right? Because uh, it'll never find anything in an empty list, and also we don't. Whoops. And also we don't want it to be. Um, to be searching anything. It's looking for the element. So if it's not it's not looking for position two, otherwise we can just do array of two, right? It's looking for uh, the value of two. Okay. So now let's say that elif find me is less than a list at current position. Then what we're going to do is we're going to return a binary search of the A list, current position, oh wait, we need to do find me next, and then current position divided by 2.
Um, okay. If you're actually in this class, uh, then I don't know. All right. And I don't know why I'm doing it this way. Um, who knows? So, hmm. I guess that's one way to do it. Maybe that's the laziest way to do it. I was thinking, I was thinking, like, could I just do th this times the current position? And then I was thinking, hmm, that that's 1.5, and that's going to give us a float, and we're going to have to do some rounding, and this is already taking care of the rounding, so let's just, let's just do it this way and see if this works. Okay. So basically, we have two recursive, we have two, um, what you call it? Um, and maybe we'll put, or, um, hmm, I think if we're going to do it this way, we actually need an upper bound and a lower bound. Hmm. I'm on, now I'm unhappy about this. Uh, do I want to do it this way then? All right, we're gonna do it a different way, which is smarter. We're gonna do it the smarter way. Um, we're gonna take slices. And that'll take to the end. And then both times we just do current position over two. Yeah, I there, there's a way to do it so uh, maybe I'll do this without slices next. I I thought I was heading for the non-slices approach, but I think I'm heading for the slices approach. So, okay. I'll just use the slices approach. In that case, actually, we don't even need current position. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it in there, because it's it's not actually doing any, any harm. Um, okay. My bad. Okay, so um, let's print out the A list each time. And so, and then let's print out a list at the current position. That way we'll get a feeling of what's going on. Okay, so let's do this. Um, and remember, we're going to search for 32. Actually, we can, well, yeah. Um, and of course, I'm ending that with a preposition. So I don't know if that, that offends you. Um, okay, here we go. Let's do it. So here's a list. Does it have 32 in it? Let's pick an element that's in it. Um, okay, let's print it out after we sort it next time. And so now let's search for 55. So let's see what happens. Watch it break. Okay, true. <laughs> um, was 55 exactly at the center or something? Oh my god. Okay, so um, this technically did what we asked it to do. Um, it searched for the element, but as it turns out, somehow uh, I picked 55, which I could not possibly have known, was the exact center of this list. So we didn't see anything here. Let's reduce the size of this uh, to maybe 10 elements so that we can see all the elements and kind of get a better feel about what might be in the middle. Okay, what do we want to search for? So let's search for 43 this time. And so basically we can do this by hand, right? So the, if the total size is eight, half of the size is four, so it should pick zero, one, two, three, four, so it should pick 49. And so that should be our first element. And then the next element should be, because it's smaller, it should go down to, uh, it should pick this size of the list, which is four, it should pick the element 2, and it should find it, right? That's what it should do. Let's hope. Look at that. It did it. Okay, let's do it again, right? Uh, the chances of that happening were 
low, I guess. I think they were probably increased just by the fact that I picked an element that was so close to 50. But, oops. Okay, so let's do it again. Let's search now for an element that doesn't exist. I mean, independently, it's one out of 100, so you're not wrong. It's just... I think, I think I accidentally kind of picked a number too close to the middle, and so that was my bad. So let's, let's search for 62, and so 62 is not in the list. So what is this going to do? It's going to go, uh, the size is 8, so it's going to search 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's going to search this element first. And, oh, it's 10, I'm sorry. So it's going to search this element first, the fifth element. And it's bigger than the fifth element, so it's going to go up. And so then what we're going to get is this remaining list, and it's going to search this one, and it's going to be smaller. And then it'll search this remaining list, and it'll search this one, and it's bigger. And then it's going to search an empty list, because it will, it's going to say, hey, take everything after this, but there's nothing after it. So let's hope this doesn't explode. It exploded. Okay. So what's the problem? Uh, oh, oh, right. Um, the, the stupid problem was that I didn't check. Right, it's, it's accessing the element at zero because the list length is zero, zero divided by two is zero, and so it's accessing that. So technically, it's my, it's my actual output code that's causing that. So let's, now that that's fixed, let's search for 54, and it should do basically the same thing. It should search, what, 22 first, and then it should search 90, and then it should search 50, and then it should search an empty list. Yes. So that's, that's where it failed here, when it, when it tried to print out the empty list at a, at a position. So really, it's this output code that's doing it. Um, OK, but anyway, the point is that here at first, it searches 22. Then it searches the element 2, which is 90. Now, of course, you could say, well, why don't you search the element 50? That's also in an element in a list of, uh, of four elements. Why don't you search the one that's the lower one? The answer is. I mean, if you look at the, my calculations where I just literally divide by 2 each time, that's the simplest possible calculation. Now you can kind of shift yourself. Um, what if you search the 0 element? Then it's going to do a kind of, yeah, let's just do that now. So let's search for the element 4. So it's basically going to search for, unless that was a joke, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's going to search 40, then it'll search. 13, I think, right? Because then it'll give us this list of five elements. It'll Five elements divided by two is two. It'll search 13, and then it'll search six, and then it'll search four. So yeah, so basically, in order to binary search for um, something like this, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Okay, so that's as much as I want to talk about um, binary search. Let's talk about other things that could be on the on the next test. So, what's my list? Um, so we talked a little bit about recursion. Um, so. Remember file input output, so uh, that's it's an important topic that I haven't really. Uh, what would so binary searches are usually used when you have a gigantic array and you want to search for a given element and you know that that array is sorted. So the thing is that the reason why it, this is um uh mm, yes I guess. But I mean, again, the real problem is that the the true examples of things that can't be done without recursion are things like the grid, right? And you remember that from the last lecture. So this is something that I mean, you can. So actually, this one is just done with a while loop. Um, 
but it's actually kind of mimicking a, a stack or a heap, which normally needs recursion. This one uses recursion. Th this is getting closer to something that you can't do without recursion. And so that's why I generally, all the examples in this class are generally things that can be done iteratively, but there are, um, are recursive solutions to them too. Okay. Um, we always used to give this problem, or two variants of this problem, uh, count uh, the twos in a number n, for instance. Uh, certainly not. Certainly not. Um, so, okay, so basically the idea of this, this problem would be something like uh, we want to count the number of times. Um, n is divisible by 2. So remember that any integer uh, n is equal to 2 to the k times j, where j is odd, right? And so it could be that k is equal to 0, so basically 2 to the 0, which is 1 times some odd number j. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the way to say it, is the binary search performs better when um, when the list is very large, because uh, if you're going to search through an entire list and you have, say, a million elements, that's going to take you a million searches, potentially. Or on average, it'll take you about a million divided by two searches, because on average, you'll search about half the list. But in a binary search, as it turns out, and this is something that you'll talk about more in later classes, the number of uh, searches is probably something on the order of the log base 2 of the size of the list. And that is a lot better. So if you if you remember your calc 1 or pre-calc or whatever, um, log is a lot less than n, right? Log n as a function is a lot less than n um, as n goes to infinity. And remember that basically what we're saying is that this is the time that the algorithm would take, is, is less than an algorithm that takes time equals n. Okay, so, um, so if you want to count the number of times that something is divisible by 2, you could do it iteratively. You could basically say uh, while um, n mod 2 is 0, and then you can say n divided by equals and what you'll generally need is a count and you'll go count plus equals one so this is this was an exam problem a number of semesters ago um, of course this was a paper exam question this is a this is something where um, we expected them to get the answer you, you know you basically had to write this answer down within approximately two or three minutes so but let's let's make up a recursive version of this, right? Why not? So there's no real reason to make this recursive, but you can kind of imagine it as a recursive function, right? And the way to think about it recursively is you could say, you know, if n mod two is equal to zero, you're going to return one plus, and remember how to count up in a recursion like this, and else return 0. And of course, here you might have to do the division. There we go. So let's just run a few examples. So um, And of course, in both of these cases, um, there's actually a small problem. Well, I guess we can. Uh, 
Okay. So this would have recursed infinitely because remember that zero mod two is also zero. So this would have uh, this would have looped infinitely, and this would have cursed infinitely because we're never actually checking to see if um, if it'll terminate. So let's just see what this does. Oh, look at that, right? Zero, it returns zero. One is odd, so it returns zero. Um, two is divisible by two once. Three is odd, so it returns zero. Four is equal to two squared. Five is odd. Six has one power of two in it, right? It's two times three, so it's got two to the one times an odd number. Seven is odd. Eight is two cubed. So that's right. Nine is odd. Ten it has a two times five. Um, oh, I oh I didn't do the other one. You would think I would do that. There we go. Anyway. Um, yeah. So then nine is odd. Ten is 2 times 5, so that's 2 times an odd number. Um, 11 is odd. 12 is 2 times 2 times 3, right? So it's 4 times 3. Uh, so the power of 2 in it is 2, so that's what that is. Uh, 13 is odd. 14, 15, and so I should say 14 is 2 times 7, and 16 is 2 to the 4th, right? So that is the nature of this little function, right? Another, uh, another thing I'll say about recursion is that it's possible that I might ask you to do a recursive function where you have to take some kind of, um, let's do a recursive function where you have to take some kind of, um, uh, with slicing. Like, let's think of it, basically I'm trying to think of a, here's what I'm thinking. Think of a string problem where you need, need to slice off the first character. Okay? Um, and so this is like the count A's thing. This is like uh, a bunch of other stuff here. So how can we come up with another problem that uses strings? So it's going to take a string is going to be the thing that we input. And what is it going to do? Yeah, the brackets problem is an example of that. So we'll, we'll just define this as test uh, count twos. Um, a and B problem. I'm trying to come up with a new problem, something I haven't used before. See, this is difficult. Um, hmm. more C's than D's. That's the A's and B's problem, right? Um, maybe I'll just have to think of something simple. So, let's, uh, a rotation problem? Sure. legal use of the letter Q. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can think of some way to use that. So let's do a recursive rotation. So actually a recursive rotation is this way. Um, so if K is equal to zero, you return a string. Else if L if K is bigger than zero, you're going to return what? Um, so you can return a string. So why am I doing this? I'm doing this because if k is equal to 0, then it's uh, not a rotation. 
it's the identity. If a string is empty, uh, then we don't uh, want to do anything below, right? So then we just return a string. If um, k is equal to zero, or if k is bigger than zero, then we can pull off the first letter and stick it on the end, like this. And then we can even do a reverse rotation if we want, l if k is less than zero. Oh, I'm sorry, we need to do ro rotation recursive of this and uh, k minus one. And l if k is bigger than less than zero, we do the exact same thing, well, almost the exact same thing. We can pull off the last letter. Um, so this is doing a reverse rotation. And we can stick the last letter on the front. So a string, len a string, minus one. Something like that. And then we can do one plus k instead of k minus one. Really, I guess you could pretend that that's just So how does this work, right? And so this is really not a, not an optimal way to do this or anything because it's doing so many uh, recursive calls. But on the other hand, it is, um, so for instance, what it's doing here is it's basically saying that if you want to rotate something k times, that's the same thing as rotating it k minus one times and then just doing the rotation once. So it's saying, uh, so that's what this is doing. It's basically doing the rotation once, and then it's calling uh, the re uh, recursive rotation on k, uh, the other thing k minus one time. So let's print out a string and k. And now let's test this out. So let's uh, do a rotation recursive on say a b c d e f g, and let's rotate it four times. Okay. Okay, so what should it be? I think it should be, if I'm right, it should be D, E, F, G, A, B, C, right? Or should, yeah, it should be that, because the first time it pulls off a G and puts it on the front, and then it pulls off the F, then the E, then the D, right? So that's what it's gonna do. That's what the fourth degree rotation, or whatever you wanna call it, is. So let's see what this does when it runs. Okay, can't see anything. So here it, okay, maybe I'm, Am I going the wrong way? Am I going the right way? The final result is that. Okay. Oh, maybe maybe I just have it overestimated. So let's see. Uh, so zero rotation is this. One rotation is this. Two rotation is this. Three rotation is this. Fourth rotation should be this, right? So what I do wrong here. Yeah, basically. I think this is off by one, right? I feel like it's off by one. Um, but I'm just a little confused about why it's off by one. Oh, look at that, it actually, uh... let's think for a second. So why is it off by one? If k is bigger than zero, it returns this, I agree. It takes the first letter. Oh, it's taking the first letter and putting it on the end. This is a forward rotation. Ah, this is the forward rotation. Okay, A, B, C, D. Oh. Oh, hey, look at that. So, yeah, the reason why it's wrong is that it's not wrong. I'm wrong. Humans are, are more wrong than code. So, okay, there we go. Let's do another one. Let's say recursive rotation on 
uh, it's better to be, what is it? I don't know. Uh, I always put an extra I in there. And let's do a, let's say 32 rotation. Well, let's do a, uh, let's see, a three rotation on this. And so you see here that it stole off the first three letters, stuck them on the end, and so that worked. So the first letter was R, put it on the end. Second letter was O, put it on the end, and a T. So now let's do what I actually thought I was doing and put a minus three. Hopefully this works and doesn't just infinitely recurse. Interesting. So that actually is bugged. There we go. Better. There we are. So. Um, yeah, so basically here, this is the reverse rotation. So it stole it off the end and it put it on the front, stole it off the end, put it on the front, stole it off the end, put it on the front. Yeah, so there we go. So this is an example of like a recursive rotation. This is basically that lab, right? Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, you could, technically, and this part was extra. You didn't have to do this for the lab. So technically, the lab was just this. Um, okay. So I think that's that's probably all the stuff I want to say about recursion. Really, I think you kind of get the point, right? Like, yeah, I think you kind of get the point. Um, maybe I'll add, we'll do a little bit of uh, file IO and then maybe we'll talk a bit more about classes. Okay. So actually let's do classes first. So what is a class? A class is an object type, right? It's basically making ourselves, I, I keep going to what a, a TA said, and I'm sure that they got it from somewhere else, but uh, TAs, TAs came up with a bunch of good analogies here. Um, basically a blueprint or maybe some kind of template, um, don't think C++, um, etc. And so the thing is that a class is basically, and what does a class have? It has variables and it has methods, which are just functions. Okay, so like to declare a class, all you have to do is say class, and then what kind of, uh, what kind of class should we make this time? Um, so, so I have an idea, hmm, yes, um, so basically I'm going to do, I want to make a little simulation. Um, I, let me see if I can, I've just been watching the, the Marble Machine video that was released today. Um, I don't know if any of you watch, uh, Winter Gotten or whatever, Winter Gotten. Um, let me try to find it. Let me try to find it. What I'm thinking of. I'm not thinking of the Winter Gotten video. I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of the gear generator. There is a good gear generator that, here it is. Anyway, 
Yeah, so I, I got it now. Cool. So basically, I want to make... Let's get rid of this uh, last gear on this one, and then I'll show you what I want. Uh, how do I... I forget. How do I do that? There we go. So here's some gears. And so... What is the syntax to assign the value of an attribute in one object to an attribute in another object? Um, so basically, you can have a gear that has something like this, where it has some number of teeth here and it has some number of teeth here. And so basically, uh, let's call that an involute gear. So. What we're going to do is when we declare the constructor of an involute gear, we're going to have n and m, which are going to be, let's call that first uh, num and second num, or teeth1 and teeth2. And so we can declare two variables, like, right? And, and so basically what we can always do here is we can make a contraption up, say, a contraption um, and we'll just make it up of a list of gears. And then what we can do here is maybe we have some methods. So what, what do you do to contraptions? You can say add a gear to a contraption. So basically this will just do self.gears.append gear. And I mean, so this might have to do more uh, if we decide that it needs it. But for now, let's just append. And then Let's say we attach gears, right? So not sure exactly how this function will work, but let's say that we want to attach gears together. So basically we want to do it so that two gears are like this, right? And when one of them turns, the other one turns. And so that's what I mean by attaching them. So if we have one gear that has a certain number of teeth and you attach it to another gear that has a certain number of teeth, then it will turn those two uh, together. And so maybe then what we'll do is something like def turn gear, right? Uh, we'll turn a gear, num turns, or maybe yeah, num turns. And so uh, then what we can do is we can determine maybe how many turns the other gears do based on gear ratios or something like that. So basically, um, if we're going to attach two gears, we have to think of a way to attach them. So what way can we attach them, right? Um, hmm, it's a good question. And of course, each one has two separate uh, sets of teeth, so I guess we'll have to determine which one is basically, uh, maybe up here in the constructor, we'll say self dot upper attach equals none, self dot lower attach equals none. And so if we, uh, if we attach two gears, we have to decide, um, basically we're gonna attach the gear one, and then this will be either upper or lower. And the second one will either be gear two, upper or lower, right? So what we're gonna do here is we say,
Yeah, well, so Aguirre's uh, number of teeth is at least... A gear's ratio is proportional to its number of teeth and some other things. Yeah. I mean, let's not get too concerned about the reality of the situation. Let's just let's just pretend that things are going to work out magically. I just want to do an example where we have some classes, right? I don't want to get focused too much on the physics. So um Yeah, so okay, so basically we say if one UL is equal to upper, and two UL is equal to upper, then what we can do is we can say gear one dot upper attach uh, is equal to gear two, and gear two dot upper attach equals gear one. Right, and so that will set the two gears to be attached if they're both upper. And then we have, I mean, so this is really the worst way to possibly ever do it. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm going to do it this way just because it doesn't matter. So if we're going to attach the lower now, so then we do um, this. And then we can do something like um, if this one is lower and this one is upper, then we do yeah, exactly. Um, something like this. And then finally, uh, we just attach both of their lowers together. Okay. So that, that's fine. And so basically now what we can do is if we turn a gear, let's, let's also make a display method. Right, so the display method is just gonna say for gear in gears, self.gears. Uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll just print out uh, gear dot, what is it? Uh, teeth one and gear dot teeth two. Okay, and that's what we'll do. Um, yep, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, There we go, and so now if we turn the gear, let's let's just do it real simple. Uh, yeah, that's if you're gonna use print, sure. I mean, sure. So if we turn a gear, right, and what do we know? So, Basically, what we are going to do is let's say if gear dot upper attach right, meaning there's something attached to the upper thing, then we're going to look at the oh this is an interesting one because we have to detect if it's so if gear dot upper attach dot lower attach is equal to gear right then it's equal then the the gear is attached the upper part of the gear is attached to the lower part of the other other gear so then we will say print um right and then what we'll do is we'll say now we have to calculate the ratios um the other gear turns um, turns how many times it's gonna turn uh, if we turn then we do num turns times gear dot upper teeth right that is a no it's teeth oh crap let's call it upper teeth and lower teeth 
that way we we know which one it is right so divided by gear dot upper attach dot lower teeth and then there's a bunch of symmetric cases right elif and then this is upper attach so then we do this again we say dot upper teeth um, and then we do another elif for um, oh no actually this is done and then we just have to do if gear dot lower attach and then we do the same thing except now we just do lower attach uh, I think that it, it, did that work who knows let's find out so remember everybody unlike what Doc J says never test your code never test anything um, and the reason why you should never test anything is because look at all this code I've written does it work who knows right let's create some gears um, and so it's gonna be the upper teeth and lower teeth I think I called involute gear so let's do this let's make it 20 teeth and 50 and let's make a gear 2 which is another involute let's make it 30 and uh, 47 right and so let's attach them so now let's make a contraption and I don't really think we need to um, Actually, we're, we're not really using the, the add gears, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway because I feel like it, right? This, this doesn't actually do anything yet. And so, um, dot attach gears. Let's attach gear one, the upper part, to gear two on the lower part and now let's do contraption dot turn gear and so now let's turn gear one I think I needed an underscore there yes let's turn it 12 times so now let's calculate what we think is gonna happen so uh, we're attaching the upper part the 20 part here to the lower part here so if this has 20 teeth and this has 47 teeth then 12 turns on that will get us how many gear teeth movements it'll get us um, 12 times 20 gear teeth movements divided by 47 so that means that we should get approximately 5.106 times so let's print out let's see what happens right well look at that look at that it works Right? I will it works. So does this mean it works? Uh no. It means it worked once. Okay. So So actually let's let's do this test. Let's see what happens here. So let's make uh this gear, let's see, what did I do? I wanted to make this gear have 20 teeth, so let's change this one here. This one will have, let's see, where's the number of teeth? Here, 20. Cool. Now the other gear is going to have 47 teeth. And now we'll zoom out, right? I think there's a zoom out. Is there a zoom out feature? I'm pretty sure. Um, and so if you look here, Let's say that the speed is 12. And if we look at the rotations per minute, it says 5.11. And so let's look back at our, our calculation here, 5.106. So as it turns out, not only did our code test correctly, but we were actually right.
for once. Isn't that amazing? Um, ah, here we go. There we are. So this gear ratio actually does uh, give us a 5.11 or 5.106. If you turn this at 12 RPM, this will turn at 5.11 RPM. Ours is more accurate, yes, because Python, here they're just rounding for the sake of engineering convenience, right? But here, in Python land, we got it. Now, here's the interesting thing that you could do, which I would never ask. So this is, this is something that I am definitely not going to ask, but this is uh, what I'm thinking, because it may be silly fun. Um, is you can recursively, like if, if a gear is attached to another gear, you could recursively go and check to see how many times that one turns and how many times the one that it's connected to turns and how many times the one it's connected to turns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you could generate some kind of recursive uh, get number of turns to see how many times all the gears connected to the uh, like the forced gear, like the gear that actually is being turned by a motor or whatever, or by a hand crank or whatever we're doing. Um, so this this is this is I think the interesting question, right? Uh, this is kind of what I had in mind, but yeah, this is way too much. That would probably be like that would probably be a project, wouldn't it be? I think that would be a project. So. And you could even tell if, like, the hmm, you could probably even find out if connecting a certain set of gears would be possible, because if you connect gears in a certain way, it would actually produce, you could determine the expected final connections RPM, and then test if it's right. So... So yeah, this is basically this is basically something where you could generate some kind of recursive get number of turns. So instead of just doing it for the next gears that it's attached to, you could do it for all the gears that are attached in the system, right? And so instead of doing this, what you would actually do is then you would call like turn gear on, right? Um, like gear dot upper attach dot right. You know, and then you would have to call it with this number of turns, right? And then you would need a base case that says, like, if the thing isn't attached or if it is attached to a gear that we've already checked. Because technically, if you go around in a loop, this assumes that there's no loops of gears. If there's a loop of gears, then you'll, you're going to need to make sure that. Uh, that you don't do that. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think that's, like, so what was the purpose of me showing you all this stuff, right? The purpose of me showing you all this stuff was to show you how two different objects, right, the gear object and the contraption object, how they interact, how you can set things and get things from one object to the other object, how you can test, like, if the gear dot the upper attachment dot the lower attachment, Right, so what this is doing is it's checking to see if the gear, if the upper uh, track of the gear is attached to the low, is attached to the lower track of the other gear, right? Because if the, the gear's upper attachment is attached to the lower teeth on the other gear, then the upper attach dot lower attach will be the gear itself, right? Because if if the upper guy is attached to the lower guy, then the lower guy is attached to the upper guy. So. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about probably is uh, file I.O. Cool. So remember, there are three modes to open a file.
I'm kind of amazed I got all this working in the first try. I didn't even make a mistake with the mathematics. Hmm. Okay. So, um, I guess I'll spend the last 10 minutes basically teaching File.io again, but also doing it in a slightly different way. Because I know I haven't taught the with command, so let me teach it with the with command. So, yeah. So, let's use with. So remember to open a file, use open, the file name, and then you need the mode, right? So the mode has to be one of the three things. It either has to be read for read, it has to be write for write, and it has to be A for append. So, Well, I kind of confused myself in the last lecture, but yeah, so the read file mode, it sets the file pointer to the start of the file, um, and uh, it does not, it, okay, the write mode opens and clears the file then sets uh, the file pointer to the, to the start of the file because there isn't anything left, right? So that's the one thing to keep in mind about the write mode. Um, so, and then remember, append so append is the same thing as it means in the list context. It means the same thing in general. It means I'm going to stick it on the end. So basically, let's let's open a file, and also remember that um, and append will create the file if it doesn't exist. Um, when you open a file that doesn't exist with the read mode, let's try to do that. So let's let's open a file uh, that doesn't exist with the read mode, okay? So, okay, let's actually get rid of all this rotation testing. There we go. So basically here, this just says uh, no such file, right? So, so if you ever get a file not found error, that's what it means. Okay, so let's open this file with write mode. And so, And so remember that when you're writing to a file, so like say the file dot write, and remember here, so why did I stick this end line on? Remember that uh, write doesn't put a new line into the file, unlike print. So print will put a new line onto the end of your output statement but write does not do that. So what you have to do is you have to actually put the end line onto your file or onto the text that you want to insert. So let's just say while file text is not equal to quit. There we go. And now you might be saying, but wait. Don't I have to close? And the answer is not with with. So, okay, here we go. 
And so what this does is it says it opens the file and then it sticks in the return file handle into with. Now you can use with for other things. You can say with x as a three, right? Or something like that. But basically the point is that um, this needs to be something that has something called an enter method. And when it runs, when it gets to the end of this, it's going to run an exit method. So this with statement will run an exit method. And then the exit method closes the file handle. So don't try to close the file handle again. So let's run this thing. What do you want to write to the file? Let's write, hello file, welcome to the world. The world is chaos. I cannot understand secrets of Gnostic truths. Um, all things are good, except those things which are not good. Um, tautologies are true by definition. Uh, Python is actually not a bad language. Okay, and then I'll quit. And so now let's look at the file. So the file was created. Yeah, so what happens if you don't put the end line in there? It's just, so notice here how all of the, the strings that I've input are stuck into the file. If you don't put the end line in there, What's going to happen is this. OK. So now, when we look at the file, is this what you want? Maybe, but it's probably not what you want. Right? The thing is all just kind of mashed up. There's no end lines. Everything is just garbled together. Now, there are times where you might want to do this. But I'm going to probably say you probably don't want to do this. Right? That's why you have So, unfortunately, Python won't so the if you input the escape sequence in a string, it's not going to it's not going to do it. So if you just go like, hey, hello, I am going to, you know, input some escape. Um, so, uh, so basically here, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to notice. Um, the reason is because even though these are escape sequences when you type them in a string in the Python IDE, like this is an escape sequence. But when it gets inputted, basically the string that gets inputted already has the double escape. So it basically, it's just reading it like this. Okay. So, okay. So that's how to write to files. So now how do you read from files? You can do the same thing with reading. And so the, the two ways to read from files are, uh, even when you read it, yeah, yeah. So you can do for line in the file, print line, or you can do something like while uh, the file dot read line, or I guess you can do like something like this. Ha. Okay, there we go. So these are two ways to read from the file. You can read individual line, or alternatively, you can read all the lines if you do something like this. So, and remember that this creates a list. So,
So let's do an example of this. So um, Okay, and then of course there's one last way to do it. The last way to do it is just to call the file.read. And so that will read the entire file. So, okay, let us do it. Let's type in some things. Um, Hi, my name is I baked some cookies. Um, that reminds me of the Uh, what's some other Pompeii graffiti that people said that I can actually type here in class? Um, I think I think there were some. This this was actually written on a wall in Pompeii. Someone scribbled today. I baked bread. So here we go. So here's all the lines. Hi, my name is Eric. Bake some cookies. That remains. There we go, and uh, some centurion wrote this on a wall. He was like, I am like Titus, and not, not enough people have like appreciated my greatness. Um, and so here is the here is the read lines version, and then here is the blah.read version. So the only thing to remember is, and you notice there's these extra end lines that are happening, right? The extra end lines are happening because read line. Uh, doesn't strip off the new line. Okay, so that's the one important thing to note about read line is that it doesn't, unlike input, it doesn't, um, it doesn't strip off the read line. Okay, so I think this is a pretty decent study guide, almost, isn't it? Sort of, kind of, maybe. I mean, if you're comfortable with everything here. then theoretically, theoretically, you should be comfortable in the exam. I'm going to try to write an easy exam. OK. And with that, uh, yeah, you can do, you can, yeah, so in order to uh, do that, um, all right, um, well, I mean, so I've been doing the file IO uh, for your first two projects, I might have you do the file I/O for project three. So, I mean, the purpose of file I/O is to be able to store stuff and to retrieve stuff, right? That that lives beyond the length of the time that your program runs. So that's basically the whole idea. Um, so any time where you think you might have a single thing where you might want to remember it for when the program ends, that's when you need file I/O. Um, Right? So, uh, have I given any thought to a Project 2 extension? I've given basically no thought to a Project 2 extension. I mean, sure, usernames, passwords, you know, when you save a Word document, where does it go? When you, when you save progress in a game, where does it go? When you load 
when you load a game, what happens? Like it has to read all the all the files. Users, oh man. Um. Well, I mean, JSON is not really in the class. The whole point is that I have a JSON is basically a dictionary, right, in a file form. But what I've done is I've put everything in the dictionary, and then I take everything out of the dictionary, and I just give you the dictionary. So a JSON is just a dictionary. Um, that's a, it's a JavaScript something something. Uh, but whatever. The point is that it, I think it's like what symbolic object notation or something like that. Is that what JSON stands for? JavaScript object notation. JavaScript object notation. So, but the point is that uh, JSON is just kind of a useful format to store dictionaries on file in files, and that's it. Um. Okay. I guess I'll post this thing, right? And then I'll end the lecture. Uh, and I guess the other thing that you might be able to, you know, glean is my relative importance and the things that I... Yeah, so you should never be touching those functions. So that's why I don't care if you understand them or not. Like, don't touch them. They're just there for my other code to call. So you never have to use them. You never have to call them. You never have to modify them. So, yeah. Okay. All right. I am going to terminate this lecture because this lecture has reached its, its uh, zenith. Or maybe it's Nadir. And that is the end of that.